Hallelujah. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody today? Are you blessed and highly flavored? Are you anointed, appointed? Are you ready for battle? Amen. Praise God. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And we have a choice, don't we? Nothing worse than a miserable Christian. Praise God. They need to stay home and go into a prayer closet and get filled with the Holy Ghost. Some people need to get re-delivered again. But praise be to God. He's faithful to complete what he started. <clears throat> Would you turn to Psalm 34, please? Psalm 34. Is everybody there? <laughs> Glory. Are you ready? Verse 1. What does it say? I will bless the Lord when I feel like it. Hmm. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall what? Continually be in my mouth. Man, if people would praise God more, they would say the some of the things that they say. Amen. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me out from what? All my fears. But what did it start with? Praise. Everyone say praise for presence. Verse 5. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his what? Troubles. Anybody ever get in any trouble? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know how you get out of it? Praise. It's called sow. You're sowing in the spirit. The more you sow, you got to sow your way out of everything. And this is not crochet. Amen. This is sowing. You are sowing in the spirit with your tongue, with your mouth, with your breath. You sow your way out of everything. No matter what it is. You need a financial blessing, you sow your way out. Whatever it is you need, you need to sow your way out. That's all it is. Too many people don't get that yet. They go to the phone instead of the throne. They blame. They grumble and complain. And that's all they need to do is sow. So they get to a place of, so what? Amen. Amen. It says, verse 7, that the angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. So what happens with the person that's not trusting in the Lord? He's cursed. Hmm. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. Remember, fear is reverence, honor, and respect. There is no want to those who fear him, or there's no lack to those who fear him. It says, young lions lack and suffer, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. None of us should be in lack. In fact, we aren't. The only thing that we're lacking of is the things that we want more of. Other than that, God provides everything. So we've got something going on here. It says, praise for presence. And worship for glory. Praise for presence, worship for glory. How many of y'all want favor? Hmm. It's going to take something called obedience. Obedience for favor. That's where you trust the Lord. Praise for presence, worship for glory, obedience for favor. Are you going to gain obedience? Are you going to gain favor from someone that you don't submit to? Can you get favor from your boss if you keep choosing to do your own thing? No. 
And this is where the enemy loves to infiltrate. Because people are so emotionally controlled. They're so controlled by how they feel that they can't be disciplined enough. And God can't trust them. They can't be consistent. There's a word called continuous, which is associated with consistency. Consistency is a tremendous key for victory. If a person can't be consistent in the things that God has given them, now many times people are misled. They say, well, God gave me this, but they, he really didn't. And then they're consistent on the wrong assignment. That's why God plugs us in. That's why he says, forsake not to assemble. See, one of the enemies is fear. This will become, people become anxious. They, and, and this anxiety and anxiousness, it moves them out. Remember, the word says, do not become anxious for anything, but prayer and supplication. So many people can't wait. They've got to move. They can't sit still. And because they move, they move out of God's position. They move out of God's timing. Then they wonder why they're not getting God's favor. Is everybody okay? So praise for presence. Without God's presence, you and I got control over nothing. Why? Because we want God's presence to control us. In 2 Peter chapter 1. Praise for presence. Second Peter chapter one. So the price is cooperation. Amen. We've all heard that before. The price is what? Cooperation. Without cooperation. You're not going to get anything. In fact, whatever you get won't last. So we got to cooperate with praise. We got to cooperate with worship. And we got to cooperate with obedience. Amen? Why? Because this is allowing me and you to continually step out of temporary into eternal. And that is the battle constantly. Remember, the temporary is always trying to draw you back. You know, when you became a Christian, you were multidimensional. Why? You're, you're a citizen of two locations. One's a temporary, one's eternal. So this means that you've got to be careful of what you're feeding more of. If you're feeding more of temporary, you become temporary. If you're feeding more of eternal, you become more eternal. You begin to see things more. That's why we're to be living from the future, not from the past. People who live from the past always live in oppression. They live in discouragement. They live in disgust. They live in regret. And they're always looking at themselves. They can't look beyond themselves. So in this, we've got to be careful because we live a multidimensional life. And the one that you feed more is the one that you will be established in more. The one that you starve more is the one that will be weaker. Everyone say, I'm multidimensional. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Let's speak it together. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be what? Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in a world through lust. So we see there's this divine power from his presence. Remember, praise for what? Presence. Divine power comes from presence. As you and I begin to praise, his presence comes, something else begins to come. His nature. It's called his glory. It's called his what? His glory. So the divine nature will come. It will proceed to divine power. Why? Because praise for presence, worship for glory. 
Praise for presence, worship for glory, obedience for favor. So in his presence, we get divine power. In his glory, we get a divine nature where you become like him. There's an exchange made. Why? Because you can't do it. You can't be obedient on your own. You know, when I was in, out there using drugs and alcohol and every other thing available that was a needle or a pill or a cigar, I tried to do it on my own. I can do it. Maybe tomorrow. I can do it. Uh, all right, I'll try it again. See, when I became a Christian, I didn't try. I did. See, if you're trying to get free, you're not going to. You must want to be free. That means you're going to do it. And there's a difference. In that, you discipline yourself to become obedient. You are going beyond the temporary because the temporary lives by emotion. It lives by memory. Every here in the temporary. What did the Lord tell us? Who is going to be my faithful disciple? He must hate his mother, his brother, sister, spouse, this, that, why? To make God first. We must cut loose. Jesus said something powerful. He said, here's my family. Here's my mother, my brother, my sisters, my, and so forth. My These are all, who are, what were they? Who were they? They're ones that did the will of God. Other than that. I don't have friends. I have brothers and sisters. Friends are dangerous. Why? Because they'll turn on you any second. Until they get unplugged from the temporary and plugged to the eternal, they are dangerous. You don't know when they're going to turn on you. I mean, I may love some of them, waiting for them to get unplugged, and they're just going to have to eat more dirt until they get unplugged. Amen? But in this, his divine power comes from his presence. His divine nature comes from his glory. We are stepping out of the temporary into the eternal in other words, living from the future to the present. It is continuously. This is where you and I must constantly always be reminded. We must constantly activate it. It's your responsibility and my responsibility to activate the eternal in our life. And cut loose from the temporary. And John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Praise for presence, worship for glory, obedience for favor. John chapter 4 and verse 9. Well, let's go to verse 7. All right, we'll start at verse 6. What the heck? <laughs> Is everybody there? Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of the Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift... The gift of God. And who it is who says you give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Here's Jesus, the presence, the glory, right there. He uses an example for her. He says, look it, if you knew the gift from my presence. Does everybody get this? If you knew the gift from my presence. This is where so many people miss. They become religious with no power. They become a form of godliness, but no power. It's not how much you know, it's who you know. And you only really know him truly by his presence. Why? Because his presence brings his, I mean, uh, praise brings his presence, worship brings his glory, and there you have the divine nature and divine power. Now you've stepped out of the temporary into the eternal. 
And this must be a continuous thing for me and you. So here is this woman, a Samaritan, who doesn't, so Jews don't associate with them. And Jesus is trying to explain to her something very important. <laughs> Saying, look it, in my presence is a special gift for you. It's called living water. See, because when you and I praise, we actually are drinking from the living water. Amen? Hallelujah. And verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then will you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into what? Everlasting life. That's the eternal, isn't it? So he was trying to explain to her in a common sense way about getting into his presence and who he was, that the presence of God was right here, and he had the gift, eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And come here. Now I want you to know that he wanted to give her it, but he couldn't because she's still living in sin. And a woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, well, you told the truth anyways. You said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five dudes you've been shaking up with. For you've had five husbands, and the one that you're shaking up with right now is not even your husband. That you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> uh, he read her laundry, didn't he? Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. And he said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship which you do not know. In other words, they don't even know they're worshiping all their idols and materialism and so forth, and their children and their spouses and their jobs and their money and you worship what you don't know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the what? The Father, in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Why? Remember, praise brings presence. Amen? Worship brings glory. That's the Father. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means in breath. Again, the gift of his presence is living water. The Father of glory brings divine nature, continually stepping out of temporary, constantly into eternal. In Psalm 40. And this makes you thirsty and hungry. Psalm 40. In verse 4 and 5. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's speak verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. So curse is the one that promote pride and lies. Amen? Many, O oh Lord, my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I could declare and speak of them, they are more than can be what? Numbered. Blessed means favored. Blessed means what? Favored. Who makes the Lord his trust. Does everybody get it? Why? Because obedience brings what? Favor. If you, listen, can somebody trust you if you can't trust them? No. It's the same way with the Lord. Can he trust you if you can't trust him? No way. It doesn't work that way. Until you fall into the place 
of praise and worship and fully trust him no matter what. He's got it all. And let me tell you something. It doesn't mean to trust him to get your way in prayer. That's not trusting God. Well, I'm trusting God to get my prayers answered. Well, what if your prayers are incorrect? What if you're praying for the wrong thing? And God doesn't answer your prayer. Then what happens? Oh, I can't trust him. He doesn't answer my prayer. Does everybody understand that? I trust him to make a way no matter what. I trust him to work all things to the good. I trust him to make my decisions, not me. Amen? Remember, there's two decisions, his will and mine. But there's only what? One choice. Only one choice. So we're always asking God for his decision, right? Or, Lord, your will be done. In other words, we want his decision. But the problem when, we, when he wants to release it, huh, not right now. I, I, I got another idea. No. <laughs> Doesn't work. Oh, not right now. Maybe in a little while. Let me go bury my family first. Let me go do this first. Let me go do that first. Let me go uh, sell my business first. Let me go, hello, say goodbye to my family or whatever it is. He's saying everybody keeps putting emotional idols before him. Hallelujah. You know, when people come into our discipleship house many times, you know, we ask them to get a little cleaned up before they come in so they don't have to detox here. And many times, they, you know, they go on their final binge. I think I'll go on my final binge before I go in. And they make it even worse. Because of that emotional idol. You know, addiction is a demon. It's not a disease. And those demons need to get fed. And they get fed by emotion. I don't care if it's a pill. I don't care if it's in a needle. I don't care if you smoke it, snort it. I don't care what it is. It's an accursed item. And it draws demonic activity. I don't care if you drink it out of a bottle. I get running across many people. What do you mean? I only drink. I'm not an addict. It's called liquid stupid. Hallelujah. Blessed, favored. Blessed what? Favored. Those who make the Lord his trust by continually trusting and obeying his requests, his decisions. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 16. What does it say? For what? For dogs. Now, this is not a barking dog, okay? Not that they don't bark, I mean... A dog in the Bible is a demonized individual. That's a representation. It is a demonized individual. It's a demonic force called a dog. And do you remember when everybody was calling people dogs? Yo, dog! In fact, there's a bounty hunter they called dog. He was proclaiming to be a Christian, but his fruits never showed it. So know that dog is a demonized individual. It is a spirit that's in an individual. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. And we know that he's, they're talking about Jesus. I can't count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far from me. My strength hastens to help me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, from the power of the, power of the, power of the dog. That means demonic presence. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild ox. Then he says, you have answered me. Then was he say, I will declare your name to the brethren. 
in the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Do you know when you and I praise and worship the Lord, He shows up? He shows up and praises with me and you. It's amazing to me how many people disrespect the presence of God, not realizing that He shows up. It says when two or more gather together, He's in the midst, right? In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Praise God. What better partner can you have in praise than Jesus? You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried out to him, he what? He what? He heard. It says, verse 25, My praise shall be of you in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. Powerful. It says dogs are demon-possessed individuals or human bodies with demon spirits. There is the power of their presence. We are, you and I are fighting powers of darkness. That means presence, influence, forces. Jesus came to the assembly to praise with us to drive out demon spirits. Do you ever notice? You change in God's presence. Your attitude, your motive, everything changes and you get convicted. Gosh, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was thinking that way. Amen. Because you've allowed his presence to begin to penetrate. The more you praise, the more his presence comes. Then you reach a level of praise of his presence, which brings you into glory. Now there's an exchange for your nature for his. And it happens by repentance. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. Amen? 1 Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. Now Saul was king of Israel. And uh, verse 10. And uh, he, was, he was anointed by the Lord, and he started off right and then began to drift. And verse 10, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as a king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Can you imagine Jesus saying that about me and you? Gosh, I regret rescuing that person. Why? Because they've turned away from me. They're now they're walking according to the dictates of their heart and towards the world. They're being led by demonic spirits and they've become a dog instead of a Christian. Saul, who was a king, became a dog in the eyes of God. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. And so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul... It was told Samuel, saying, Saul went up to Carmel, and indeed he went up to, to the monument for him. He was going to set up a monument for himself. Saul was setting up a monument for himself. Hello. Disobedient Saul. And he has gone on around, passed by the, and gone down uh, to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed a commandment of the Lord. Oh, boy. But Samuel said, what then is this pleading of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites and from the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. That was the biggest mistake right there. He said, not my God, your God. Even though the Lord anointed him to fulfill the mission. 
but again, what did the Lord tell Samuel? He said, or tell, yeah, he told Samuel, look it, I regret I made Saul king. Why? Because he's turned back from what I've been telling him what to do. And to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. And I'll tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, in other words, when you were humble, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission. Everyone say mission. Do you know that you are on a mission? Sometimes in the mission, there's a training for the next part of the mission. So you may start the mission, amen, then there's a pause and there's training and preparation for the other part, amen, and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are what? Consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but, but ministry, right? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. Brought back Agog, king of Amalekite. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder sheep and oxen. Now he's putting blame. Of course, he was boasting that he brought all this good stuff back, right? Now he's blaming the people for taking it. The best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, has the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices is obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as a sin of what? Witchcraft and stubbornness is, a, is iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord... He has also rejected you from being what? King. That is a position. Saul won from king to dog. Does everybody understand? Now, the only thing that can remove this arena would be praise. In, Psalms, in, in uh, Samuel 16, the next, go to verse 13, next chapter. Go to verse 13. It says, and Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. In verse 14, is everybody there? But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. First of all, God said, look it, I regret for calling him. But he's still the king. I'm going to remove him from kingship. So I got to choose someone else to put that anointing on. So the spirit went, so he found David. He went and anointed David. The spirit of the Lord came upon him. The spirit of kingship came upon him. Amen. Now David didn't become king right then and that day, did he? No. He was going through the process. So the presence of kingship was put on David. Somebody get this. And the presence of kingship was removed from Saul. Let me tell you, when the presence of God lifts you, I can tell you first thing is demons are going to show up to take their place. It says, The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul in a distressing, tormenting spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling. In other words, you're acting a little strange. You're anxious. You're bitter. You have totally changed. Your continence is different. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from the Lord is upon you. And you shall be what? Well, so even the servants knew that the presence of God through praise would come and remove the spirit. Does everybody understand? Oh, hallelujah. Now, Saul, who become distressed, I mean, when you think about what is distress, it's anxiousness, it's fear, it's worry, it's, it's torment, it's restlessness, can't sleep. And, and uh, 
Samuel 17, and verse 38. Hallelujah. Uh, I want to go back. I'm sorry. Verse 16, and I want to just uh, go to verse 23 in chapter 16. just want you to see this, which is important. In verse 23 in Samuel, 6, in Samuel 16, is everybody there? What does it say? So, when, so it was whenever the Spirit of God was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play it with his hand, and, the, and then Saul would become what? Refreshed. Well, and the distressing spirit will what? Depart from him. Praise brings what? Presence. Okay. So, now Samuel 17. So here all of this stuff is going on. Now, so you got uh, David who is now in the presence of Saul all the time. He's his armor bearer now. He's praising and worshiping because he's carrying the presence of God. He's been anointed king, but he's not king. So the only way Saul could sustain kingship was to have the presence of David there to maintain kingship the whole time. So when David booked, Saul became really crazy. Verse 38. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on bronze helmet and on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in the pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. Now this is where David's now anointed king. Amen. But he hasn't fulfilled his position yet. See, there's always testing. God tests you before he really sets you in position. He wants you to know the anointing. So now there's this Nephilim, an offspring of the fallen angels called Goliath. He was a giant, huge. And the Philistine, and he was tormenting the army of Israel. And he was challenging everyone to come out and battle him. No one would go out. And David shows up. He was actually just bringing food to his brothers that were in the, in the military there. Cheese and wine and whatever. And he saw what was going on. He said, hold on a second. Now here David shows up, but he's carrying the anointing better than any army. Better than any armor and any weapon. He's carrying the anointing. He sees what's going on. The boldness of the anointing comes upon him. He says, is no going to fight this guy. He's defiling the army of Israel, the Lord our God, the one who created us. Nobody would go out. He said, man, I'll go out there. And then Saul tried to dress him with his armor. You can't wear somebody else's armor. He said, wait a minute. I, I got a, I'm going to be led by the Spirit of the Lord. I know what he wants me to do. So he gets a stone, puts it in his back, gets a sling. Verse 41. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked at and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and what? Good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? David should have said, yes. You are a dog. You are a demon-possessed giant. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. No power. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied today. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, 
that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my, hand, into my hands today. So it was when the Philistine drew and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put in his hand in a pouch and bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead. And he fell on his face to the earth. Now, I want you to understand that the word of God is known as a rock, stone, hard. So David took the physical word of God that he spoke and he swung it. Where did it hit him? In the mind, in the head. Amen. And this giant fell right on his face. Boom. It says, so David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David because David didn't need a sword. But it's amazing. The Philistine provided his own sword to cut off, get his own head cut off. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. They booked. Amen. They ran for their lives. Again, the giant dog came barking with a loud voice. David, anointed by God, came in the presence, power, and truth of God Almighty, called the anointing. He decreed death to the demon-possessed giant. <laughs> he called on God. The word, which is the stone, penetrated his mind, his head, brought him down. And David took his sword and cut off his head. David was a true soldier of Christ. In Proverbs 26. Praise brings presence. Amen? Glory brings nature, divine nature. Amen? Because his presence brings divine power, doesn't it? Amen? Worship brings his glory. Glory is his nature. And obedience brings favor. In Proverbs 26 and verse 10. The great God who formed everything gives the fool, gives the fool his hire and transgressor his wages. As a dog returns his own vomit, a fool repeats its folly. Now what's a dog? Demonized individual. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? Let him be more hope for a fool than for him. So he says a, 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 a demon, a dog, returns as a fool, repeats his folly. That's called a backslidden condition. God looks at an individual as a, back, a backslidden condition as a dog. Now, a backslidden condition means a person is not repented to be rescued. The longer you take to repent, the more demons come and take you. In Philippians 3. It's a dog's place. A backslidden condition is a dog's place. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot where I was at. Everybody's calling, yo, dog, what's going on? I mean, pastor's calling all the pastors a dog. I'm like, what is this? Doesn't anybody read the Bible or what? Hallelujah. Philippians 3, verse 1. Let's speak it. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of what? Hello. Man, we got a lot of dogs as politicians. We got a lot of dogs as mayors. We got a lot of dogs as judges and attorneys. 
I'm telling you, they're all over the place. And that's all they can do is bark. They got a big mouth and do nothing. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I much more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Christ means the anointing. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may what? Know him. How are you going to know him without his presence? You can read all about him and really not know him. Amen that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Wow. He says, beware of dogs, demon-possessed politicians, journalists, news reporters, websites, media, music, movies, religion, festivals. You know how many Christians still celebrate Halloween? Dumb. Stinking Dumb. A Christian that still, still celebrates Halloween has been bit by a dog. It is the worst satanic ritual day. Well, we don't celebrate. We call it festival, fall festival. No, you don't, don't celebrate it at all. Does everybody understand this? You know how many children are sacrificed that day? You know what trick or treat means? Come on. Trick, hello, says don't get deceived by the wiles and trickery of the devil. Treat, the devil's always got something to offer you for, which is a lie. Remember, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of porridge, right? Stew. It's amazing to me how many Christians still celebrate that worst satanic ritual festival. Oh, we're not going to celebrate. We're going to just dress up as good people. You're still portraying a dress up. That's false. You want to celebrate a festival? Don't dress up. Come as you are. You have a true identity and worship the Lord. Amen. And bring food and everything else and have a good time. But honor the Lord. Bring his presence and his glory and fellowship. But this stuff... I mean, that's just a justification and compromise. That's okay. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're going to dress him up as Moses. Believe me, I was told by the Lord one year to dress up as Moses. But believe me, I got persecuted like crazy. Because everybody came to my house, got a letter, said, you just cooperated with the worst satanic ritual day of the year and you are cursed. They didn't like me too much. <laughs> Fix. I put it on every label of all the stuff. I had all kinds of bags of chips and stuff. I put it all out there. And every, everything that was on there had a label. Repent. You just participated in the worst event of the year. <laughs> I kept saying, Lord, what? Really? You want me to do this? I mean, there's a powerful testimony behind all of this. Praise God. But we don't have all day. Is everybody Okay. <laughs> So again, you know, there are, there are doggy doctors. <laughs> and all they, they, they fear no God. There's no fear of the Lord. And there's no, no reverence and respect to God's presence. And there is no presence in their life of God. See, if there's presence of God and glory of God in your life, you have power. Remember, praise brings presence. Amen. Worship brings glory. Divine power. Divine nature. Divine power, divine nature. You overcome everything. 
if you're not overcoming everything, I'm not saying you're not going to make a mistake, but when you do, you quickly repent and get out of it. Amen? If you stay in there and justify why you're doing what you're doing, which is not right before God, you just got bit. And eventually, you're going to have pups. <laughs> Revelation 22. Isn't there a saying of, what is it, a doggy world, a dog eat dog world? I don't know. What is it? Dog eat dog. Well, the Lord says that the wicked, amen, will destroy the evil. So, hallelujah. Revelation 22, verse 12. Let's speak it together. Verse 12. Is everybody there? And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are what? Dogs. Outside the what? The gates of salvation are dogs. Sorcerers, sexual immoral, murderers, idolaters. Whoever loves and practices a, a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely, which is where? In his presence. Outside are dogs. Again, backslidden Christians, servants of Satan, demon-possessed individuals, drug addicts, liars, homosexuals, transgenders, lesbians, witches, child molestationers. These are all outside the kingdom. And those that promote and vote for abortion and same-sex marriage, they will not get in the kingdom. Because what you approve of, you will also be judged of. There's a lot of people thinking, I'm okay. And they ain't okay. And I'm going to close this 2 Timothy 3. Good people don't get into heaven. Only righteous ones do. Second Timothy 3.10. Is everybody okay? So don't call, well, you can call somebody a dog. That's a dog, you know. They're demonized. <laughs> Pelosi, Schumer, Chef, they're all dogs. They bark every time they get behind the, the pulpit up there. They're on the news all the time barking because they're a bunch of liars. CNN is a load of dogs. They got their own kennel. MSNBC, C uh, BBC, uh, <laughs> Turner Broadcasting, they're all dogged out. Need to throw them a bone of salvation. <laughs> Verse 10, is everybody all right? Let's speak it. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to be in Antioch, at Icium at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must what? Continue. There it is again. Continually, continually, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
continually denying self, picking up the cross and fighting so that you and I can constantly follow. Always stepping out of temporary and past into eternal and future. Amen? Remember, praise brings presence. Worship brings glory. Obedience brings favor. Remember, in his presence is divine power. In his glory is divine nature. You overcome everything. Amen? Praise God. Father, we give you glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for your word and everything that has been spoken and released and imparted. Lord, we ask that you protect it with the blood of Christ, that every seed would grow and bear fruit. Lord, establish us, perfect us, and quicken us to what you have said and spoken to us today. Lord, help us, Lord, to constantly be armed, that we may be armed and ready for whatever it is the enemy tries to attack us with. And we promise to give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you.